I'm Adam Salati with the eClinical Works podcast, and this is part two of our interview with John Lynn from healthcarescene.com, a collection of blogs that covers the healthcare industry. So take a look at the conclusion of our interview. You know, once we get patient engagement going, and, and, and we should, I think, discuss some examples that we've seen where it's worked and, and, and that kind of stuff to, to prove our point, but I think we're starting to touch on the fact that patient engagement almost needs to be tailored for your audience. There's no kind of, I mean, I think people, when they hear the words patient engagement, they think, well, oh, I've got to do something that's going to work for everybody, right? But, you know, kind of like P.T. Barnum said, you can't please all of the people all of the time. And I think patient engagement is kind of a lot like that. It's, it's, it's going to be customized, right? I mean, that's why we have uh, an EMR system that tracks all sorts of things about patients, like the conditions and their demographics and even whether they prefer phone or text messages for reminders and that type of thing. So, you know, when you look at those types of campaigns, you almost got to think, you know, all right, who are the people who are most likely to be engaged and, and most likely to be engaged by this particular topic? You know, the, all the push about chronic care management, uh, uh, which is, you know, something CMS is reimbursing for. Uh, now and, and and really targeting those things and even saying you know those chronic care patients the patients with those you know long-term uncontrolled diabetes those are the people who are more likely to respond to some sort of uh, uh, patient engagement and outreach yeah a couple things there one is kind of going back a little is uh a lot of doctors are afraid that if they start engaging patients that they'll actually reduce the number of office visits they get. And, and I've found the opposite to be true. Often when they ask the question, you know, for example, you know, should I come in for an office visit? Then the, you end up driving more office visits be, and better office visits because many of those people that are asking these questions and engaging with the doctor are ones that their choice is, okay, well, if I can engage online, then I'll go, I'll do it. But if I can't engage online, then oh, maybe I'll just skip the doctor completely. And so then it just allows things to get worse. And so I think that's one issue, too, that needs to be addressed is that, and, and understood is that by engaging them, you can actually drive your fee-for-service business as well because you'll often engage people that would have just delayed that that action or that office visit until later. So I think that's one side of things. But once you start engaging them, uh, you know, uh, I think the other key, like you said, is the personalization and understanding. And many times that doesn't have to be the doctor. That could be the nurse. That can be the front desk staff that could answer the questions, that can engage them in a way, and then escalate it to an office visit, to a telemedicine visit, or other things. But the real problem I've seen in most of the people's implementation of this is they do it from a very tech-oriented standpoint. A great example is one that uh, you know, I think we're going to talk about is, is kind of this text message reminder service. It's like, okay, well, we want to make sure that they're complying with their medication, right? That's a great patient engagement solution, and we want to customize it. We know, okay, they should be taking this medication, and they haven't filled it, so let's just send them a text reminder to fill it. And you're like, that's great. I mean, wouldn't you want that, right? Because then you're like, oh, I forgot to fill it. Let me go fill it, and I'll do it. Sounds reasonable. And it works for the 10% of people that aren't taking their drug because they forgot. You know, and that 10% obviously is flexible, but it's a smaller percentage than we think. That you know, the reason they're non-compliant with their medication is because they forgot. If the problem is they forgot, then a text message works well. The problem is what about the other 90% of people or whatever the you know specific figure is, whatever the other people aren't taking it because they couldn't afford it or aren't taking it because they couldn't get to the pharmacy or aren't taking it because they don't trust the doctor and so they didn't want to take it because they don't think that the medication is actually going to fix the problem, right? I mean, so there's this whole suite of other problems that exist that we need to incorporate into our engagement efforts. Otherwise, it's just falling on deaf ears. I mean, sure, it's great that we helped that 10% that it actually benefited because they just needed a reminder. But if we do so, we can actually damage the other 90% by engaging with them in a way that actually shames them and makes them feel bad that they can't take their drug because they can't afford it or whatever other problem there is. So, I, you know, I think that goes back to kind of uh, making sure that that relationship, which is really what we're talking about, right, John? I mean, we're talking about ways that you can strengthen that relationship. And I know, you know, we talked, I mentioned, PCMH briefly before it really puts an emphasis on making sure when you when you prescribe a medication asking the patient you know are there any things that would make this hard for you to get like do you have trouble getting to the pharmacy do you have trouble paying for your medication so that the practice can then try to incorporate some of that into the ways that it targets their patients 
and sends the reminders to the appropriate people. So, you know, theoretically, and I think eClinical Works can do this, you know, you can take that uh, information that you've gathered, you've put into your patient's demographics, or you put into your patient's chart and says, all right, we'd like to send out a medication reminder to all these people, but maybe we need to exclude or send a different message to those people who've said they have barriers like financial barriers or you know, different types of things. So, I mean, and I think really that's the power of the EMR, right? I mean, that's kind of why one of the reasons that we're, we're trying to make this push is so that we can use that information in a more intelligent manner to, to guide this type of engagement and make sure that patients are, feel more understood and more uh, um, connected to their doctor. But let's not address it that way. Let's address, you know, what's the real problem? Getting to the root problem and, and addressing it in a way that helps them actually change behavior. You know, and so for example, maybe you meet someone and they're okay. They're, well, they're not taking their drugs. You're like, okay, or or maybe they can't get to an office appointment, right? So you know, the tech solution is, oh, we'll send them an Uber credit. And now they can get an Uber and go there, right? I mean, that's what our tech my I mean, I'm a, I'm a tech guy by background. That's what we say. We're like, oh, just solve the problem. It's like. Well, was that the real problem? Well, if you look into it more, the real problem was they weren't sleeping at night. And because they weren't sleeping at night, they were depressed. And because they were depressed, they lost their job. And because they lost their job, they couldn't afford their car payment. So now they don't have a car. And now that's why they can't get in to do their appointment. And so you really need to address the sleeping issue, not the car problem by sending them an Uber, right? Otherwise, you didn't really improve the care and you didn't really understand the patient. And so, yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. I think there's multiple elements to this. One, you have to identify what's the real problem for the patient and then what's the right way to engage them. And that's more behavioral science than it is technology. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that, that brings to mind... Um... You know, you know, motivational interviewing. I know my doctor does does some of that, figuring out, you know, do I know, you know, what I want out of my treatment? Do I know, you know, what's going to make me actually go through with it and follow through with it and that kind of stuff and knowing knowing more about me. And that kind of leads me to the question of, you know, what what do we think are some of the long term effects that we're going to see in terms of like reducing spending? Does patient engagement really have um, the ability to move the needle. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's early to, to say for sure. But, uh, you know, there's great examples. Uh, you know, I was thinking when you told your story, I heard about this senior example where they called them, I think, every day or every week or some, something like that. So they called them on a regular scheduled basis to ensure, you know, how is the senior doing? Are they following their compliance plan? And what was interesting from this study, and they, they weren't able to tease out did it benefit the patient? Because they saw huge benefits to that patient population and lower costs and improved compliance, all of those things. They said, but what we weren't sure is, did the patient benefit because of the things we said on the call or because they knew a call was coming? And in the senior population, that's a big deal, right? Because And they're the most expensive part of, of healthcare because they have so many chronic conditions, et cetera. But just the fact that they knew that someone was going to call, gave them that, something to look forward to, gave them something interesting, something exciting to change their day. And, and so just, you know, they, they weren't sure. Like they were still doing the research. So like, okay, was it just the fact that we were going to call and engage them, you know, once a day or once a week or whatever it was? Or was it – that we, what we actually said on the call that really influenced the behavior change. So, I mean, it's early days to really know what are the impact of these efforts. Um, but I think there's huge potential, right? We know that when, if we focus on these, then, you know, I think we can put that, you know, improvement there, you know, if, if we put more attention to it. The problem in the past was we didn't pay anyone to do that. Right? I mean, no doctor was paid to actually lower the cost of their patient's care. In fact, in many ways, they were paid more to have more care. I mean, that was the business model. So, you know, it's still early on in, in predicting, you know, what will, how will this lower cost and will it do it effectively? But I think there's huge promise if we do it the right way. Another example that's interesting is, is really comes from C.T. Lin that we talked about previously. He actually has done a lot of work on when should you give the lab results or the x-ray results or the other you know various results in the patient portal because that's another great way to engage them because if you give them the result early, then they don't stress as much. You know, if, 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 if it's a normal result and you already have it, just push it out. Don't wait for the doctor to read it. Uh, they've seen an interesting evolution though. How quickly can they get them out? Uh, 
and what they found is for a lot of results, you may want to have a two to three day wait, because if you're going to tell them, you know, you have cancer, or if you're going to tell them your baby is dead because of some, you know, lab test that realized, oh, your baby's dead and we're going to have to do a DNC and take your baby out or, you know, these really life changing type of results, you need to give a certain period of time to be able to do that. But I heard him talk recently and he said they had an experience where forever they just given out the result immediately in real time fashion to all of these mothers, you know, about their child. Right. And then they looked at it and, you know, they had this really bad incident where someone got it on a Friday evening and then they had it all weekend stressing. They weren't hearing back from the doctor and it provided all this chaos, right? Like, oh, we should never give it until that we know that, you know, it's a good result. And he's like, OK, let's relax. We've pushed out these results for three years or whatever it was, like a long period of time, two, three years, and no one's had any issue with it. In fact, patients love it because then they know early. They don't have to wait for the doctor to read it and do it. He's like, so are we just overreacting over this one incident when we've had it for years that proves that it's really not as big of an issue as it is? So I I think there's going to be some evolution as people learn when is the right time to do it and how do we present it. And I think we're going to see a huge evolution in that. In fact, I think ECW will play a big role in that is that when you provide them lab results, when you provide them diagnoses, when you provide them CBD codes or plans, how is that going to be ingested by the patient? Is it going to be done in a way that they understand it, that they can process it, that they can understand what's normal, that they can understand when it's okay for it to be abnormal and that they shouldn't stress about it because you know they have higher levels because of this other disease? I mean that's going to become really sophisticated and we're going to really help with health literacy with the patients so that they really understand what the results mean and that's going to happen electronically. That's not going to happen through people. So I think maybe that's the next level of engagement is really – facilitating those types of things and whether it comes through the portal a text message whatever other means that you communicate it to the patient you know we're going to have to work hard on making it so that the patient can understand what that data means yeah good point and um like you said maybe maybe one of the things is uh, you could set up a rule so that your your lab results that are getting published don't go out after like 2 p.m on a friday or something like that that's certainly possible um, you know, and, and in any clinical works, I know that for certain tests uh, or, or, you know, when you review the lab, the lab result doesn't go to the patient portal until it is reviewed. Um, so, you know, for those extra sensitive things, you can say, all right, hold this back. And then the rest of them will go. The rest of them will go to the portal. Um, so there are those, you know, definitely those, those capabilities. But as you said, it's going to get more sophisticated, more refined, Definitely. more tailored to, you know, as we learn more and gain that experience. Uh, um, but but I think the other really important thing that you mentioned there, uh, John, is that they did this for three years and had like one really serious bad incident. And I think you know we've talked about fear before. You know doctors are afraid that this is going to really negatively impact them. But I think that one incident out of however many thousands and thousands of labs that must have been sent out, it's a very small occurrence. Um, I think it's a reasonable uh, you know to expect one or two situations. Like that, and that, and that. I think the ultimate takeaway is that don't be afraid. Put this in place. The the benefits seem to outweigh the risks there. So for a final question, John, uh, who who really needs to take responsibility for patient engagement? Is it the doctors? Is it the vendors? Is it the patient? Is it some? You know, you you have on your website uh, a conversation you had uh, with some people from the uh, from the LA Healthcare Quality Forum who had some great success with patient engagement and a campaign that they did statewide there. So who, who's going to help make this a success? Yeah. So yeah, the Louisiana Healthcare Quality Forum is, is really interesting because they actually literally are doing the marketing effort to get patients engaged in Louisiana in their care and to get them signed up on portals, to get them participating in portals. That's a unique effort, but I think we can learn a lot from them because what they found is you'd be surprised who wants to access that. 
I mean, they have some stories of these old men that want to access their patient portal, and they they barely use technology, and yet they want to be there on the portal, getting access to their healthcare and getting access to their information. So I think that's the first step, and I think we need to be careful who we judge might be interested in engaging with doctors uh, in their care. Uh, but you know, the answer is, is is we all have to, right? We all play a role. If the technology solutions aren't there to engage the patients, then doctors won't do it. If doctors don't want to engage the patient, they're not going to, although there's some incentives trying to push that direction and, and helping afford that. And if a patient doesn't care, I mean, the doctor can try to engage the patient all they want, but if they don't illustrate to the patient why it's worthwhile for them to engage the, with the doctor, it's not going to happen. So it really takes everyone involved and it takes the right approach that actually adds value as opposed to these kind of you know, top line things that don't really change the care and don't really engage the patient. They don't improve care. They don't make it easier for anyone. Uh, you know, that's the problem, you know, but as we focus on more uh, efforts that really do improve our care and we can quantify the way a patient's impacted, that's where we're going to really see huge, inc- uh, inc- huge increases in engagement from patients. Uh, and, and you mentioned there's, you know, there's some, a learning curve there is what it sounds like you're mentioning. You know, there's a, you said there's there's a right way to do the patient engagement, and you know, just to to let people who are watching know, you know, eClinicalWorks we have lots of case studies uh, that you can learn from on our website. We have lots of videos and other conversations uh, on our other podcasts with people who've been there, who've done that. You can learn from their experiences. So you know, definitely check those things out for our viewers who are watching. But John, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, you have one more thing. Yeah, so I was at a conference recently, and I I think it was Amy uh, Cuddy uh, uh, that said, we need more people in healthcare to care. I think that describes it best. (laughs) Good good words, yes, absolutely pertinent and uh, and definitely uh, words to live by. Well, John, thank you so much for for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a great conversation. Hopefully we can do it again in the future. And and for those of you who are watching, check out healthcarescene.com. They've got lots of uh, different blog threads that you can follow on all aspects of of healthcare uh, and and some great videos and conversations and and articles to read there as well. So, John, thanks for your time. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for watching the conclusion of our interview with John Lynn from healthcarescene.com. Now, if you missed it, you can also find part one on YouTube, iTunes, or my.eclinicalworks.com. And if you'd like to see more of our episodes, you can check them out there as well. For the eClinical Works podcast, I'm Adam Salati, and thanks for watching. This broadcast and its contents are the sole property of eClinical Works and are protected by federal law and international treaties. You are strictly prohibited from making a copy of, modification of, or form of rebroadcasting or re-encoding this broadcast without prior written permission from eClinical Works Public Relations, except as many be permitted by law. This broadcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is intended as a personal, non-commercial use. Product specifications are subject to change without notice. Please contact eClinical Works Public Relations with any questions. eClinical Works V10 EHR is ONC HIT 2014 edition certified as a complete EHR. eClinical Works V10 CC 2014 95 54 47 1.